If you want, you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. We are going to be in the Sermon on the Mount. Shocker! <laughs> so we're going to be there again. Chapter 7 is where we start today. But as I was kind of preparing for this lesson, as I was thinking about this sermon uh, earlier this year, I had the privilege <coughs> of being on jury duty. And I don't know if you've ever had a chance to sit on jury duty, but from the onset, we were instructed to listen to the evidence that was presented. And then based upon that evidence, we were to reach a verdict. Now this verdict, it was not to be based upon a whim or a hunch. This verdict, it was based upon the standard of the law. And as a jury, we were tasked with the, the privilege and the responsibility to determine if the defendant that sat before us was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, jury duty, it is a really fascinating process. And to be able to sit there and kind of go through step by step, FYI, I was also the foreman. I wasn't just a jury guy, I was like the jury guy. Uh, I was the guy that stood up and gave the verdict, that was it. But uh, our judicial system, Specifically for criminal cases, it uses a jury of peers to try to ensure a fair and unbiased outcome. This jury, it is composed of other citizens, and they sit as judge. And they're there to determine guilt or innocence. But it's not in their own opinion, it is based upon the standard of law. Right? Now, as we kind of get back into the idea of the Sermon on the Mount. Much of the Sermon on the Mount, it has dealt with the standard of the Mosaic Law, which was God's law that has been handed down to Moses. And Jesus, he uses six times, you have heard, but I say to you statements. Now these statements, they contrast what was being taught by the religious leaders to what the real standard of the law, what God's word really says at the heart level. Now, read through the Gospels with Jesus, and you start to see that there is this constantly cracking down nature uh, of Jesus kind of calling out these religious leaders. He calls them at some place, you brood of vipers. He calls them dogs, you whited sepulchers, hypocrites. These are things that is a common practice with Jesus as he's calling them out. What these religious leaders were instructing, it was directly against what Scripture communicated. Basically what these religious leaders were doing is they were intentionally disseminating error. And Jesus had a big, big problem with that. So, when we get to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and we're starting to get there, we're starting in chapter 7, as we get there, Jesus says this idea, do not judge, so that you will not be judged. So, you got to ask yourself, what is honestly being communicated? Okay? It almost seems, maybe from the forefront, that this is kind of contrary to what he had been saying prior. I want to tell you, it is absolutely not. Sadly, our society, we've taken this verse and we've kind of removed it out of context, and we've twisted it, and we've ended up coming to wrong conclusions. We've often misunderstood, and therefore we have misapplied what is actually happening here. And I say there is a monumental difference between hypocritical judgment and being people who are tasked to be discerning individuals. Okay? And so I want to read Matthew 7, 1 through 6. That's all that we're going to cover today. But this is what it says in Matthew 7, 1 through 6. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will, clear, you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine. 
or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. God's standard explicitly condemns sin. As a follower of Jesus Christ, all of us must call sin, sin. We can't just kind of do our own idea of what we think. It's all based upon what God's Word says. We, we are not able, we should never get to the place where we try to sugarcoat or maybe even minimize our sin. That's not allowed. All of us must discern God uh, good from evil, what is right from wrong. Everything needs to be taken back to Scripture. It needs to be compared to God's perfect and holy standard. And this standard, it exposes and it condemns sin. The context of this passage, which you see that is written here, it clarifies any type of confusion that we may have on this. It says, do not judge so that you will not be judged. This is a warning that is happening. God's perfect and holy standard must first be personally applied. Then, and only then, do we assist our brother in Christ. Believers must first deal with our own sin. That means we can't ignore it, we can't justify it, we can't rationalize it. We have to deal with our sin. And then God, he uses, some of the way that he uses this is so cool. He uses other mature believers to come alongside us to help us, to maybe sometimes identify that sin, to maybe help us to address that particular sin, which if we're left to ourselves, we are easy to sometimes try to cover it up. We are sometimes, uh, we get comfortable with it. And so having iron sharpening iron, having another believer of solid mind that looks at Scripture and goes, hey, I don't know. Let's talk about this. It's really, really important for us. The process of addressing sin, it is only problematic when we want our own sin more than we want God's holiness. Amen. Right? That's a big problem. Do we hate sin like God hates sin? Or have we somehow concocted an idea where we can somehow coexist and blend God's standard of holiness with the idea of our comfortable sinful patterns? Light and darkness, good and evil, they cannot be mixed. They have no part with each other. All sin is to be hated. Today, our title, uh, maybe to loosen and lighten it up just a little bit, because that seems like a little bit of a, oh, where are we going with all this today? Right? To, lighten it, to lighten it up just a smidge, today's title is Logs, Dogs, and Hogs. Okay? But in all seriousness, I do want us to kind of just stop for a second before we kind of proceed into this, and really let's honestly evaluate ourselves. And you got to ask yourself, are we really willing to see sin the way that God sees sin? Are we willing to evaluate sin by God's perfect and holy standard? Before we attempt to assist another believer in Christ, are we willing to honestly evaluate our own selves by God's standard? These are critical questions, and this is what the text is driving home. We really have to be able to answer those. So I'm going to lead us in prayer, but I'm going to ask that we all humbly come before the Lord and just ask Him to work in our lives personally and that He would use us corporately. Let's go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, it's a little bit of a weighty passage. Lord, uh, it, I don't think it's going to necessarily make us super comfortable. But you know what? I love that about Scripture. It is not written to make me comfortable. It is written to make me more Christ-like. And so, Lord, I thank you for this. It points out a very, very big, vulnerable area. Lord, I think all of us, if we are not careful, can fall into it. And so, God, I pray as we individually evaluate this, Lord, I pray as we as a church evaluate this, that you, through the Holy Spirit, will speak to us and challenge us 
that you would encourage us and motivate us. Lord, the task is great. The responsibility is great. But Lord, I pray that you would give us a spirit of humility. Because Lord, this is something that I think a lot of churches can um, maybe twist. Not just the, the outside of the church people can get this wrong. I think people that are your followers. And maybe they do it for um, a proper motive, I don't know. Uh, maybe they intend well. But Lord, I think we need to be real careful as we go into this. And we just ask that you will speak to us through your word today. And we love you. And we praise in your name. Let me start off by saying God hates a haughty spirit. Okay? Over and over again you see in Scripture that God condemns the idea of haughtiness. Now, haughtiness, it means arrogant. It means uh, blatantly and disdainfully proud. It means setting yourself above another. In Scripture, especially in Proverbs 16, haughtiness precedes destruction. Proverbs 16, uh, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before stumbling. And I say it is never acceptable to cross-compare. That is not what God wants us to do. We are never to horizontally compare ourselves to other people. We are always to take it right back to the source. And that's where we're supposed to go. God deals with and he interacts with each of us individually. And I love that aspect. Okay, When he's trying to deal with you on something, that's amazing. And we should stop and rejoice over that. But equally so, when he's dealing with me on something, we should always be like, hey, that is phenomenal. Because God is at work. And that is really a cool thing. But he, every moment of every day, God, he is conforming you and I as we follow him individually. He is molding us and conforming us to his image. We are becoming, as we follow in his steps, we are becoming Christ-like. Okay, so if you think about this on like a big giant um, graph, okay, the longer you live in life, Hopefully, the more Christ-like you are becoming. Now, it could be a bell curve. It could be kind of a bell curve this way. But hopefully, you're seeing as you look over the year, as you look over the last five years, as you look over from when you first accepted Christ to now, you should see that type of growth. There should be growth. Realize this. Right now, God desires to address heart-level issues sin issues in each and every one of us that are here. Daily, all of us should be growing and maturing. And part of that growth process that God has chosen, and this is so phenomenal, to aid in that process, God engrafts other strong, mature believers to interact with you, to pour into your life to devote their time, energy, and effort to be able to point you back to His Word, the Scripture. Can I just say, I personally am incredibly grateful for those strong, biblically-minded men that the Lord has laid into my life. That, and it's not, they don't come to me in a haughty way. Like, oh, you've missed it. Now, they probably could, because there's areas that's like, ah, you repeat offender. No, no. Right? Maybe you feel that way. But they don't come to me that way. They come to me and they're like, hey, you know, I, I have noticed this. My, my observations have pointed this out. What's going on? And it's really more of just a question to kind of get me thinking. It's like, oh, yeah, no, that, I, I saw how you interacted with your wife this week. Oh, what's going on then? Oh, okay, that puts the rubber to the road. <laughs> okay? And you have these types of things, but these guys... They are awesome and they are so valuable. This is where you really get those iron sharpening iron moments. It strengthens you. It sharpens you. And I can tell you, every single person in this room should have people like that in your life. And if you don't have that, you need to find that. Okay? I also want to say in this passage, as I, as I read it and look at it, what Jesus is not correcting 
is this idea of just judgmentally going to somebody and, and trying to point out all their flaws. Jesus is not talking about that. The heart issue, that the wrong heart issue being addressed is that of judgmentalness stuff. Uh, it's possessing a haughty spirit. It is viewing yourself more spiritual. We need to really take that and put that under a microscope before you end up helping somebody else. And so Matthew 7, 1 through 2, it says, Do not judge. And it goes on. So that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Now, it starts off in the three words. It says, do not judge. This is a command. Okay? And this command it is to stop an action that is already taking place. It is already in progress. And you need to stop it. Okay? It's basically saying, right now, stop it. Stop judging, and do not judge in the future either. Okay? It is a stop now, and stop continually concept. A similar train of logic, we've already looked at it with Jesus' prayer. When he was teaching his disciples to pray earlier in Matthew chapter 6, 12 and then 14 and 15, specifically on this topic of forgiveness, this is what it says. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Okay, what's basically being communicated is we should expect to be treated by God in a similar manner to how we treat others. In this way, if we have forgiven others, expect to be forgiven by God. However, the flip side is, if we are harshly judging others, and that's where we set ourselves, expect to be harshly judged by God as well. When we harshly judge others, it reveals that we really don't understand God's mercy and God's grace toward us personally. There, there's a disconnect that is happening when we start to put ourselves in that seat. I, I really like how uh, Sinclair Ferguson, uh, he puts this. The heart that has tasted the Lord's grace and forgiveness will always be restrained in its judgment of others. It has seen itself Deserving judgment and condemnation before the Lord. And yet, instead of experiencing his burning anger, has tasted his infinite mercy. Can we just pause for a second and think about God's grace and mercy toward us? Can we think about, for maybe just a minute, God's patience and his forgiveness toward us? When we, end up, uh, when we end up displaying that same type of grace, mercy, patience, forgiveness toward other people, the same character of God is being displayed through our actions. That really drives us to the place that the way that we interact and the way that we react to people matters greatly. It is something that is of pretty good substantial weight. Going on, Matthew 7, 3 through 4. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? Think about how honestly prideful <laughs> and judgmental really is. To actually think that you are in a proper place to correct a brother's sin issue when you have not addressed your own. Wow! That's pride. That's arrogance. That's haughtiness right on the surface. It is utterly ridiculous to think you can help correct someone else 
when you are in an even more needful situation of being corrected. That's the picture that Jesus is painting for people. Sinclair Ferguson, again, he succinctly puts it like this. So deeply has his sin conquered him that he has become blind to it. Sensitivity to sin in others, he has been desensitized to the sin in his own heart. Another commentator, he says it like this, before we burn in our hearts with unrighteous anger toward others, we would do ourselves a big spiritual favor by ruthlessly inspecting our own hearts and lives first. The entire illustration which Jesus describes, it is actually a downright humorous illustration. It's almost cartoony in the way that he portrays this. It's really over the top. And yet at the same time, it's a really convicting illustration. It's one that kind of pierces right to the heart. If we are not careful, each and every one of us can fall into the same trap. Truth is, we are all simply broken people relying on our Savior to fix us. And all that we do is point people to Jesus. That's our responsibility. And Matthew uh, 7 5. He goes on, he says, You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Before any of us are fit to assist another believer, we must take the log out of our own eye. That's another command. This one calls for immediate and decisive action. You can basically say this says, do it and do it now. This action it is that it is coming under the microscope, it is an order of operations thing, not the entire practice of helping a brother. Okay? It is how do you do this in the timing in which you do it. Don't mix that up. You are required to go and do this, but don't get it out of uh, sync. Don't put the timetable ahead of itself. All of us need to uh, be in each other's lives. Each of us, we need to have iron sharpening iron. Sometimes, if we're not careful, we can get so blinded by sin, which it comes in sometimes, and oftentimes, super sneaky, and in subtle ways, where you didn't see it coming, or maybe you just left a little crack in your life, and then all of a sudden you've got this area that is becoming a bigger and bigger problem. Because that's how sin works. We need other believers to sometimes help us to see what is really going on and bring us back to Scripture and to help us to see it in light of Scripture. However, before a believer okay, is able to assist another believer, okay, that believer must address their own sin properly. Uh, a commentator by the name of David Aiken. He says, inspection of others without introspection of myself is the road to playing the hypocrite. Charles Spurgeon, he says, after we are ourselves sanctified, we are bound to be eyes to the blind and correctors of unholy living. But not till then. All of us, we need to take our sin seriously. Very, very seriously before we ever dream of helping another follower of Christ. And then he goes on and he concludes this idea in uh, verse 6. And he says, Do not give what is holy to dogs. And do not throw your pearls before swine. For they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Okay? The first five verses, it deals with carefully correcting a brother or sister in Christ. Be sure not to be judgmental or self-righteous in the process. Okay? Verse 6, it kind of switches gears ever so slightly 
and it addresses the proper response to someone who maybe rejects the gospel, uh, and he does it by force. And Jesus, he uses two animal illustrations to drive this point home. He uses dogs, and he uses hogs, or pigs, or swine. Now dogs, during Jesus' time, these animals, they are not your cute little domesticated little poodles, or German shepherds, or whatever dog you have. These are wild animals that lived in packs. They were scavengers, and they were ferocious. These were actually dangerous animals. So you can almost think of them as like ravenous coyotes or things like that that are out there, wolves. Uh, these dogs, they roamed the Roman roads, and they were looking for scraps. That's kind of the backdrop that you see with dogs. Jesus, he parallels these wild dogs to individuals who are evil and wicked. People who despise the gospel message. They don't want things to do with that. These animals are ravenous. And they would rip you to shreds if they had the chance. When you encounter individuals who are hostile toward the gospel message, we need to be careful. We need to be guarded. Okay? And it says in here, do not give. Okay, that means never give. Don't ever do it. Okay? When you're doing this, we need to be very, very careful about being discerning. Our job is not to sit here and play, this person gets to hear the gospel, this person doesn't. Okay, that's not what this is saying. It is saying, when you pick up on the sense that somebody is hostile towards it, it doesn't mean dig in your feet and be equally hostile back to them. It means, okay, it's not now. <laughs> Maybe another time. I'll keep you in my prayers. Thanks. And then we leave it and we go on. Okay? The second thing... Now, the second animal is hogs, or pigs. And you think about that to the Jewish person. Pigs were filthy. They were unclean. Never in all of Scripture are pigs presented in a positive light. They're pretty nasty animals. But they're delicious. <laughs> pigs don't recognize the beauty and value of pearls. And Jed, as a pig farmer, you will know this. You give them pearls, they don't care. You can put a beautiful string of pearls around their neck, and they won't care at all. If it bothers them, it's off, it's in the mud, it's in the muck, they're going to trample over it. And that's the picture. But you think about that on what is really the most beautiful thing that we as believers have. It is the, the gospel message. There is nothing more valuable than that. Jesus, later in the book of Matthew, in, in Matthew 13, he again parallels pearls to the precious kingdom of heaven. He says this in Matthew 13, 45 to 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one per, uh, person of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought. Jesus' main point regarding dogs and hogs is this. And we can kind of bullet point it. Dogs will never show proper respect for holy things. And hogs, they will never recognize the beauty and value of pearls. These animals don't just reject, they actually sometimes actively persecute. It's not just a failure to respond, it is downright aggressive opposition. These individuals, they are hostile. So putting all of Jesus' teaching together from verses 1 to 6, if we are not personally examining and evaluating and addressing sin in our own individual lives, we will have a very hard time distinguishing between uh, the difference between a fellow believer who is in a relatively minor sin issue and somebody who is an actual enemy who desires to do us harm. Okay? We really need to be careful. Okay? Um, one commentator, I really liked how he put this, he said, if genuine introspection does not occur, a disciple may blunder on the side of judgmental hypocrisy or naive gullibility. Ignorance of oneself is often mixed with arrogance toward others with disastrous results. 
So there are really three really big warnings that are being given to us by Jesus. And all of us need to watch out for each of these laws. Okay? Take sin seriously. And start by addressing your own sin before humbly helping another believer. We must always, in everything that we share and communicate, we must be willing to speak the truth in love. Okay? Don't lose that peace. Don't be just dogmatic. I know I'm right. God's word says this. Okay? Thus saith the Lord. Now that may be true. You might be right in what you're saying, but the way you're saying it is awfully offensive. You've got to be careful. Evaluate that. Second thing, dogs. Beware of those individuals who have zero reverence for holy things. They really are seeking to cause harm. And then you think of the hogs. Beware of these individuals too. They don't recognize the beauty and value of what you're really sharing. Recognize who you are speaking with. Okay, understand. Because here's the thing. If you are talking to someone that is a believer, you speak different to that person. You communicate truths differently to that person. If you're speaking to someone who is not a believer, someone who is yet to have a personal relationship with Christ, then you speak a little different. Again, you've got to keep the main thing the main thing. We are, we are to be gospel-focused, specifically to one another, uh, because, again, that's what we're drawing everybody back to. This is what God's Word says. This is, this is who we are in Christ because of what Christ has done. Okay? We bring them back to the gospel. But in the same way, just in a different way, we're bringing people to the gospel when they're not believers. People have yet to accept Christ. It's not to remind them of who they are in Christ, it's to say, this is what people in Christ are. It's glorious. This is the change that Christ makes in a person's life. Before you address those itty-bitty issues, or maybe large, <laughs> very big issues. But you can't do the symptoms of an unbeliever before you do the heart. And it's not your responsibility to do the heart. It is just point people to the one who changes them. And that's what is being communicated in all of us. If we are not careful, what we share can not just fall on hostile ears, it can fall on deaf ears. So we need to have a sensitivity in how we go about this. Allow God to work in you so that he is able to work through you to share the gospel. Our responsibility is to share the gospel, plant seeds, and really specifically pray for one another. Lift them up in prayer. And it's not just a cloak statement. I pray for you. No, it is a specific. Today, I want to lift Ashley Rader up. And this is, this is the things I know. And I want to just pray specifically for her. Or maybe it's the other way. Maybe it's, Lord, I don't know if this person has a relationship with you. I love, this is one thing I really love about my son. He has such a sensitive spirit. I shared this in uh, Sunday school. Luke, he just has this desire to, to do this big, broad prayer. Lord, pray that everyone in the world comes to know you as Savior. And it's like, I want to foster that. I want to bottle that up and be like, yes, Lord, yes. But can we also take it a step further? Instead of just this faceless void, maybe bring it real practical and be like, Lord, Joe. That's just the name I pulled out. I don't think I know a Joe. But Joe, Lord, this person's been on my heart. This person's been on my mind. He's a colleague. I come across him all the time. Lord, help him. You know what that does? This is the cool thing. It softens my heart to that person. It makes me way more interested in that person. I will be more ready to follow up and be like, so Joe, <laughs> how is such and such going on? And they're like, whoa, you care. You knew, and you care. You know how weird that is to a lot of people? And then you follow up, don't disconnect the dots. Help them to see, Joe, the Lord laid you on my heart this week. Oh, that's more than I thought of you. Did you see the difference there? 
I, the Lord lays you on my heart. It really drives them to the place that there's an infinite God who is infinitely personal. And he's invested and interested in you, Joe. Let me tell you about that God. And it gives you those opportunities. But I think that's really as we go to all of this. We need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Right? We want to do individually what is right by what God's Word says. We want to be holy more than we want to be comfortable. We want God more than we want that specific sin. But then it doesn't stop there. The second command is great, is equal in this, however it goes. It says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And then it says to love your neighbor as yourself. Treat them the way that you want to be treated. It is so important. Okay? It is so important to love other people. It is not, and I think this is the big balance, it is it's not the law, it is the law coupled with love. It's not part and parcel, it's both. It is you have to understand the holy standard of God. We don't just push that away because ah, it's all about grace, it's all about love. Now it is, but you also have to understand and go back to scripture and be like, that's wrong. <laughs> I can't continue to go down that path. That drives us to the place of a choice, repentance. So how we end up choosing this, it really is the three warnings that we see. Logs, dogs, and hogs. May the Lord use it. Let's pray. Father, I know there have been times in my life where I, I feel justified in a strong dogmatic stance where I honestly... I value being right more than I esteem another person. Whether they're a believer or an unbeliever, Lord, my job is not to be their Holy Spirit. My job is to lovingly come alongside them and where you afford the opportunity after you address the issues in my own life, Lord, to help me to maybe be used in some capacity filled with humility, Lord, to just say, hey, as one beggar found bread, let me point you to the source that's changed me. Because that's really what we all get the privilege of being a part of. And Lord, as we engage with a world that is often very hostile, or uh, completely disregards the value and the beauty of what really the gospel is, Lord, give us wisdom and discernment to interact and to share the true hope in Christ in love. Lord, to be able to gently come alongside them, not to bash them over the head, Lord, but give us ways to really reach out and to really specifically pray for those individuals that you have allowed into our life. Lord, it's not just, Lord, take this person away, or Lord, fix this situation. I think that's often where our prayers uh, instantly go. Lord, help us to think a little bit more spiritually mature. Go one step beyond that, Lord, use this situation. How can I, in this moment, exalt you above what I want as comfort? Or how can I speak the truth in love? Is there a way? And Lord, give us the wisdom and discernment to know how to properly and effectively love, whether they're a believer or an unbeliever, Lord, pointing people to Christ. Lord, we thank you for that privilege. And we look forward to how you use us, that we can rejoice with one another over that process. And we pray this in your precious name. Amen.